Karen Hunter, host of The Karen Hunter Show on Sirius XM. I'm a journalist, professor, and publisher, and also one of the history makers. Welcome to the final program for the History Makers 20 at 2020, the History Makers Digital Archive Innovative Uses. Over the course of this 20 day celebration, we have discussed content from the rich history found within the History Makers Digital Archive. Today's discussion will examine other innovative ways the History Makers Digital Archive can be used. Dan Johnson, Digital Preservation Librarian at the University of Iowa and the History Makers Digital Archivist for more than a decade. Mike Crystal, Teaching Professor of the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon University. Mike has led the development of the History Makers Digital Archive for 17 years. Also with us, Dean Michael G. Mason, Associate Dean of African American Affairs at the University of Virginia. Also with us, Estelle Friedman, professor in US history at Stanford University, and Leah Glenn, professor of dance and Africana studies at the College of William and Mary. Welcome all of you. Let's begin with Dan. When many of us consider the History Makers Collection, we think of the .org website, which has the profiles and photos of the people who have been interviewed. Can you explain the difference between the collection and this new History Makers digital archive? Absolutely. So. Like you said, the, the .org website is really just biographies of the people that we've interviewed, where the, the digital archive and the actual um, digi digital video is really the essence of the actual collection. So the History Makers is a life oral history archive, and the, the footage from the interviews, the stories that those people tell are really the archive. So the biography is kind of our summation, maybe of their interviews, but the, the content, the interviews themselves really make up what is the History Makers. Now, Mike, the History Makers first developed a relationship with CMU when its founder, Juliana Richardson, contacted Howard Walkler in 2001. Howard was then director of the Infermedia Digital and basically adopted the History Makers. Together, you and Brian Mayer brought the archive online. What was your vision for the content all those years ago and how does it compare with your vision today? We knew once you had a large amount of video, it was difficult to search and find what you were really after. But there were technologies out there from computer science, from machine learning, that you could apply and understand better what's inside the video. And it became even more important as people started watching video from their phones and tablets. How can you get to that nugget you really wanted without investing a lot of time? That's where technology and the content really came together and work well together in the digital archive. Let's begin with Dan. Tell us the difference between the collection, which I'm actually a part of, and what, what we're about to see from Mike. Tell us the difference or show us the difference. How about that? Thank you. Yes, I'm uh, Dan Johnson. I'm a consulting archivist with the History Makers. I began working with the History Makers in 2008 as part of a collaboration with the University of Illinois. I was 23 years old and a graduate student in the Library and Information Science program and brand new to the profession. I was able to secure a part-time job with the History Makers for the summer, and I was told that it was possible that it would be for the summer only. Twelve years later, I'm still working with the organization, as I also work as a digital, art, digital preservation librarian at the University of Iowa. I'm here today to talk about the History Makers archival collections and how they have become part of the online digital archive that we will explore in this program today. The History Makers collection consists of videotaped life oral histories, that means each interviewee discusses everything from their earliest memories and family backgrounds all the way through their careers and up to the current date of the interview. The interviewees are chosen from a variety of professions in dispersed geographic regions, but each history maker is an African American by descent who has made a significant contribution in some area of American life or culture, or who has been associated with a particular movement, movement or organization that is important to the African American community. Our history makers come from all walks of life and disciplines, including art, business, civics, education, entertainment, law, media, medicine, military, music, politics, religion, science, sports, and style. The average interview is about three and a half hours in length, although some are 20 hours long. The archival collections of the history makers consist of video, documentation, and photographs. Over the last 20 years, 3,344 interviews have been conducted, over 3,907 videotaped sessions in 41 different states, consisting of over 22,000 tapes or about 11,000 hours of footage. 
The History Makers archives has hundreds of thousands of documents pertaining to the interviewee's life and the logistics of the interview, including release forms, correspondence, and biographies. During many interviews, personal photos are shared, narrated, and digitized. This, this now consists of a collection of 50,000 images. Building a collection of this size creates for, formidable challenges. Most importantly, how do we preserve this collection for the long term, and how do we make it accessible for users? Let's start with preservation. Until 2009, all of the interviews were shot on Betacam SP videotapes. Since that day, all interviews have been shot digitally. The history makers went through an extensive process, process to digitize all 14,000 beta tapes, as well as all the documentation about the interviews. The digital content is stored in multiple locations and in archival formats. In addition, in 2014, the history makers partnered with the Library of Congress, who is now an official repository for the history makers. The Library of Congress houses physical and digital copies of this material for the long term, and their expertise provides a solid foundation for the preservation of this collection. Preserving the collection would be fruitless if it was not also accessible. The History Makers created its digital archive, which we'll learn a lot more about in this program, to solve this problem, but it took a lot of work to get the material into this tool. Video is by nature hard to make accessible. For example, it would take nearly two years to watch all of this content in the History Makers archives. We had to figure out a way to make the material easier to explore. To do this, we created extensive data for each interview, including 500,000 pages of transcripts. Through a process of segmenting, this data is used to turn a mountain of video into a highly searchable and explorable digital archive. We will learn more about the History Makers Digital Archive from Mike Crystal at Carnegie Mellon University. First of all, Dan, great job, amazing. Mike Crystal, show us what this new digital archive looks like. Yeah, I'll be happy to. I will talk over a demo that I made using the new interface that will be released soon. So this is a new interface that was funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And you can get at over 150,000 stories from nearly 2,700 history makers. The front page shows people born this day. You can drill in and find all the history makers and look through people from all walks of life. And this is one way to get into the archive to look through the biographies. Now this would be exhaustive, so what you need to do is have some sort of information. That's what the left panel does. The left side has facets where we can drill into just the education makers and find out who are the education makers, the teachers in this, or we can do searches. So we can decide we're gonna search on Reverend and find all the reverends in this corpus by looking at the biographies. Once you drill down, you really wanna see where are these people from maybe? What's their birth state? And you can look at that from a list but it's even better to look at the text to see how is Reverend matching in all of this, or maybe look at a geographic map. The darker color shows more people in that state. There's a lot born in Alabama, so we can click on Alabama and drill down to just the Reverends born in Alabama. Here we can flip back to the text, to the grid and see their photos and decide that, yeah, we wanna zoom into the one female here and find out more about her stories. For any person in the corpus, you can look at all of their stories, and if you have the time, you can play them back to back to back and find the whole interview. Or if you wish, you can search inside. So we can search on healing and find all the healing stories inside this particular person. Maybe as a researcher, we say, that's a great idea. I'm gonna go back to the list of reverends and I'm gonna search on healing. So I'll flip to a different person, search on healing, and decide that, yes, indeed, this is an interesting story. I want to play it. What are your hopes and concerns for the African-American communities? Now, underneath the search, uh, there's a match bar in purple there, in violet. It's showing where the terms are matching. This is really important. We can jump to where he talks about healing. It's of ministry. For the purpose of healing, that's another thing. But if you're in the ministry for the purpose of seeing how many people you can drum out of something, which I think is the case with a lot of our churches. And I don't mind saying it. I'm a, I'm a minister. I've been one for 45 years, and so I don't care. Uh, I, I have no qualms about saying what I'm saying. You know, I, I, I think when you reach the point that your only concern or your major concern, especially in the ministry, 
is you. You lost focus. So there's really powerful words inside of these stories. We can search all the stories. And I happen to know there's a story about kerosene and baseball. So I'll search kerosene baseball. And now I'm searching the 150,000 stories. Here are three. I'll play that first Do you one. remember, I'm going to get to the baseball, but I want to remember, what is your earliest memory growing up? Do you remember? What, what? I remember when I was in Mobile, we played, we lived right next to the field, two doors from the field. We used to play ball night, night and day. We used to soak a ball in kerosene all day and play with it. I started playing ball when I was about five or six years old, and I haven't looked back. So, oh, you okay? Oh, okay. Now, why would you why would you uh, soak the ball in kerosene? Huh? You said you would soak the ball in kerosene. Yeah. Why would you soak the ball in kerosene? So we could see it at night. We could play. We we light it and play with it. So this is an example where video really does this story justice. Just reading this as text wouldn't have that same sort of power. I might look at this and say, it's a great story. I'm going to add it to my clips. And in fact, I'm going to look at my clips and I'm going to save those as baseball stories and put it in a form that I can then put in email or share as a, a text message to other people so that if they get this link, they can go into their browser window and then open up this story like I'm showing here and open up the story set to get those great baseball stories. This is what we're trying to do to share these stories for research, for entertainment, for academic reasons, for entertainment reasons. Now I'm gonna search a broader query, Tulsa, and just experiment, explore the, the city of Tulsa. I can read these headlines, get a sense of what's going on, and I can drill into the 1920s, uh, which is uh, an interesting decade for this particular city. So I'm gonna play the first story. You grew up in Tulsa. Yes. And Tulsa has a very interesting history. Yes, it does. Did you order? To tell us when she was 16, the riot took place, I think, in 1921. But my father was living there, and he would tell it to us in the house, because believe it or not, did you know that black people and black teachers were afraid to talk about that riot? Uh, when we so this happens a lot, where this story might trigger a research idea. I can search on riots and then find out what else is happening with that particular term across decades? See that a lot, are happen a lot of riot stories are there in the 1960s. Look at the geographic dis distribution in the 1960s. Switch the 1920s. See that Oklahoma is lit up as we found out that there were these Tulsa stories for that decade. I want to finish off with looking at a person, Spike Lee. So we can ask about Spike Lee. We can use the filters again to say, I want art makers. And I'm going to look specifically at Ruby D and Ossie Davis talking about Spike Lee. Tell us about your collaboration with Spike Lee. Um, Spike was uh, a young man that came to our attention through our son Guy, who said to us, I, there's a guy that I invested $500 in his film, and guess what? He's paying me back. <laughs> We were thoroughly shocked by this unorthodox behavior. <laughs> so again, we can use the match ticks underneath to jump to where Spike is talked about. Someone would say, hey, Ma, I got another check from Spike, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he, and he was, he's a man of integrity, and he did so much to open up the, the unions. Uh, doesn't have any connection with the culture that came before. When we did Jungle Fever, for example, uh, I did the writing of the part because Spike was not familiar with what went on in the church and how it would work out and various things like that. And even when he came to do the film Malcolm X, I had uh, some reservations even after I saw the film. And I said to myself, and I hope Ruby was listening, I said, I like what Spike has done with the film Malcolm X. But I'd like to come back in 10 years and see what he would do with it then. Because it, the, the, Spike, in a sense, represents that area in our experience where we have to make absolutely sure that the materials of our lives are available to them 
This material that we're doing now, the history makers, we do this in part to make available to Spike the material he needs to complete his education. So this is so true all over this corpus where you get humor and important messages together. So this wow. work is a new interface. This interface is developed by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation grant. It makes things much more accessible. You saw the closed captioning. Uh, hopefully this demo lets you see some of the nice power we have inside of the corpus. The Andrew W. Mellon Foundation supported uh, the history makers and University of Virginia and Carnegie Mellon University in working on this interface which we really focused on accessibility. There's closed captioning throughout. There are new features. All of this will be available to subscribers in the community at large starting in 2021. It's a powerful tool that I know as an educator myself, I can't wait to dig into. And there are people who are already using it. Dean Mason, uh, I, how valuable is this tool that, that, we're just, that we just saw? How valuable is this for you? What a wonderful question to start with. Uh, you know, I was just talking with my daughter about the meaning of the word hallelujah, you know, as a thousand thanks. And I think that's sort of the spirit in which I'm going to approach that question. It's, a, it's one of the most extraordinary archives that I've ever encountered. I've told Ms. Richardson, uh, actually speaking of her, I want to say, you know, congratulations on this 20th celebration. Uh, it's a tremendous gift that you've given, not just the U.S., but the world. And thank you for that. Uh, but I, I was talking with, uh, you know, Ms. Richardson about how, it, you know, now that I've encountered this thing, it, I am absolutely possessed by it. And I use it for everything. If you're from the South, you know about Frank's Red Hot, uh, hot Sauce, and there's this commercial where the, the older woman says she puts it on everything, right? I use the digital archive for absolutely everything. And it is essential, uh, it, it is, uh, it, it's not an understatement to say that it is the backbone of what I do right now. Uh, one of the things that I would love to highlight is that the digital archive can be used in many ways. I know that a part of what we do is focus on how we might use it in our pedagogy, use it across the curriculum. However, I have worked really hard to make use of the digital car archive across all facets of my job description. And fortunately, I have a lot of platforms to do just that. Uh, one of the things that I want to think a little bit about, about though, as, as I start to sort of share my narrative with you, is I wanted to think a little bit about how this happened. So in 2018, I was writing a, a community remark uh, at the invitation of our university librarian, uh, the dean of the library system, John Unsworth. And he was asking me to respond to a question about how the library system functions to bring in black artifacts, artifacts of black experience. Uh, and this particular response was around a burnt cross uh, that belonged to Sarah Patton Boyle. Uh, and I was sort of asking about the, the, the library's role in making sure that there is artifacts that center black experience. And that went well. Uh, it was really well received. And, you know, a few months later, I got this invitation into a technical meeting with the History Makers Digital Archive. And in that meeting, they asked me to think a little bit about how we might engage our university community with the archive. And that question turned into really a long lasting love affair uh, with the digital archive. And what I hope to share a bit right now is just a few things that I've gained by working with the History Makers Digital Archive. And so the first thing that I did with this university support was develop a university engagement strategy, which intended to connect faculty and students to the digital archive, but also to become the background of university cultural programming at our university. And that worked beautifully uh, because at our university, one, I'm really connected to faculty. And I was able to go out and round together nine of us who would commit to the work of integrating the digital archive in our classes. And that integration, you know, uh, it, it, it ranged from uh, uh, language and arts, uh, uh, rhetoric, English and rhetorics, and uh, ethnomusicology, and history of education, and psychology, and sociology. Uh, there were professors across the university who, in many ways, also fell in love with the digital archive and absolutely changed our usage profile at the university. 
But as I was mentioning, because I'm the director of the Black Culture Center, I also had access to the Black History Month programming. And for those of you who don't know it and have not done so yet, I would encourage you to begin to type in your university, type in your community, type in your birth state, your home city, and just begin to see who is actually around you right now. Now, for those of us at universities, you're gonna be surprised to discover that you probably have history makers right now on your campus. And at UVA, we're really excited to have uh, Rita Dove. Now, that month we did a lot of programs, uh, but one that I really wanna highlight that turned out to be a really uh, wonderful moment and what I think was a, a unquestionable success was our evening with Juliana Richardson. And that was a great opportunity in which we were able to connect not only the archive, but the architect of the archive with students who really appreciated her work and faculty and staff who also were invested in making use of it and appreciating her that evening. Now, one of the things that came out of that was a clip. Uh, one of the students who wrote, uh, she wrote a, a, a spoken word piece and she found a clip of a University of Virginia alum. And what I think I'll do is just share that clip with you just to give you an idea about how we were able to make use of the digital archive to begin a long process of extending our origin story beyond this current moment, all the way back to 1960. Okay, now this is the University of Virginia, yes. founded by Thomas Jefferson back in <laughs> what, 18 or 17 something, I don't know. I don't um, remember the, ex I should. That's a bad wahoo apparently, but. <laughs> I, it was in the 1780s, I think, but okay. I'm, I'm not sure what year it was founded. Um, but yes, Thomas Jefferson's University. And, and I learned to, uh, you know, I learned to appreciate Thomas Jefferson over the years, but during those four years, I hated Thomas Jefferson because he represented all the bigotry and, and the, the sexism that I encountered there. Um, I remember my first day of class, I didn't see any black people the entire day until I returned to my college dorm, where there were about three or four blacks in that dorm. I was stunned because I thought growing up in integrated schools, at least part of the time, that I was used to being around a wide variety of people. What I wasn't used to being around was an exclusive environment. Um, and while most of the people kind of ignored you, uh, there was the, I would say, the nasty secret things that people would do that, that I, I, I learned to steel myself against by my third, fourth year. And that is that when you're walking down the hallway, you know, everyone's juggling past you. And so, you know, you're bumping into people. But there would be some people who would pass by you and they would hit you with their shoulder, sometimes hard enough to knock you back. And I would get a lot of that. Um, and so that was the, the, the kind of, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't stabbings that some of the North of 17 experienced, but, you know, it was, it was that nasty kind of racism. Um, there were times that uh, if you were, sometimes there would be two or three of us who were black walking down the street and people would pass by in cars, calling you nigger, 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 throwing water balloons at you, that kind of thing. Now, that clip was a, a fire starter. Uh, for our community in the sense that we began to search the digital archive for more examples of alumni uh, who had experiences well before our current body, uh, before current faculty and staff, before the current students. And we found so much. And that richness has become the backbone for a lot of the work that I'm doing currently around the Black Archive at the University of Virginia. Uh, in that work, Hundreds and hundreds of people participated. In the evening with Ms. Richardson, over 300 people attended, nine professors, dozens, dozens, and dozens of students uh, were impacted by that work. However, what probably is the most important benefit to me uh, of the digital archive is the capacity for self-reflection. One of the most useful 
uh, transformative aspects of the work that I did was being introduced to so many of these interviews through my students. Uh, one of the groups in my class uh, that fall selected Dick Gregory as their soul maker, the person who they saw themselves in the most. And by doing that, they forced me to have to listen to the entire interview in order to be able to integrate it fully into my class. And there was one clip, if you can imagine this, one clip that completely changed my life as an educator. And I think I wanna play that clip, uh, but I wanna give you a little context first. For many years, you know, I've been a professor and I tell a short story about how I got my, you know, I cut my teeth uh, as, a, as an educator. And the story is simply this. When I started teaching, I was so excited to go into a little small school in New Orleans and begin to help students learn math and science. And my whole life I had been taking tests and I just assumed that that was what you did. And I went into that school armed with my red pens, handed out those papers, got them back and began to grade them. Overnight, I discovered that nearly 90% of the students had failed this simple math assessment, basic arithmetic. And I discovered that these kids were well below the grade level. I was teaching fifth, seventh, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade math, and they just did poorly. Uh, but I handed those papers back with red marks everywhere and of course encouraged the students to take them home and show them to their parents. Those students did that. However, when I came to school the next day, there was a line of parents and I got to work at around 6.30 and they were waiting for me. And the burning question on every one of their tongues was what did I do that their students went from making straight A's the previous year to making an F on a simple math test the first day of school. Now, in that exchange, there was one that sort of is burnt into my mind. Uh, there was one response. And I remember looking at a daughter and I asked the daughter, do you know what 11 times 12 is? And the young woman said the wrong number, the wrong answer. And I looked at the mother and I said the same thing. Do you know what 11 times 12 is? And the mother got the answer wrong too. And I remember saying to them, this is what happened. This is why your daughter got an F on the first day of school. And we committed together, you know, we worked together and we came up with a plan and I do think I was really helpful to all of those young students over the time that I was at St. David's School in New Orleans. But it wasn't until I watched this clip from Dick Gregory's interview that I actually fully understand, understood what I had done. And I'm gonna share that with you in hopes that you might save yourself some anguish, especially for those of us who are educators. Homework. I don't know where my dad is. The lights is cut off. It's cold. In the winter time, there was no such thing as refrigerators then, or central air condition, or central heat. So I got a group of thugs, hoodlums, criminals, who don't have the integrity to know what a lot of black folks was going through, and they give me homework to a house with no lights. And in my first book, I talked about how this, this black folk bought a turkey by our house for Christmas, and they knew our lights was cut off and we had no heat, and they bring us a raw turkey. My mama was nice. She said, thank you. I, I went and threw it in the backyard. And so, <clears throat> how do you give me homework? How is my mama supposed to help me with trigonometry when she can't spell it? Huh? She ain't never had arithmetic. That's the next move. Huh? If I got to live in this society that demands certain things, then they'll go to the church and say, we're going to have study. See, the most trifling, ignorant, dog time black have never wanted their children to do bad in school. Huh? Have never wanted their children to grow up and be nothing but humpler than pimps. On lesson, they were crazy. Didn't you? You can... But when I come home with my homework and there's nobody there to help me, and then I, I get pneumonia 
I'm out of school two weeks. I go back. They didn't stop nothing. It continued on. So the next thing I know, I'm, I'm, I'm being laughed at. And, and so then I quit school. I didn't. That's where your juvenile gangs was coming from. Folks that had they stayed, they could have been PhDs. But there were circumstances that nobody surrounded me but demanded certain things out of me in a white racist system and didn't leave leeway. Let me, let me explain this a little better from a track standpoint. For years, the world was not aware that if you was in lane one and I was in lane two and she was in lane three and she was in lane four across that lane one runs a shorter distance if we're going to go around, not straight. Then lane two, lane two runs a shorter distance in lane three. So when they found out, they said, oh, my God. And that's why at a certain period of time, you go look at the race, they have them staggered. Hmm? Lane one is in the back. Hmm? Lane two is ahead of that. And lane nine is way up. But they're still running the same time. Well, that's where I, I, I look at this with, when integration came and, 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 and white folks started seeing me out there. And they got upset. Because they didn't know I was staggered and in the right lane equal with everybody else. And so when I'm going to school and I've been sick for like three weeks, I go back, I go into class and they spelling. And so the word is hospital. So she getting ready to get to the G's. And I got this little girl sitting in there, I kind of like, you know how that went, that crazy stuff. You never told her. You just like her. She's my girlfriend. So they're getting ready to call on me, and I jump up and call the teacher a black bitch. I'm like seven years old. Why? Because I thought for the whole world to know I call the teacher a black bitch, then no, I can't spell hospital. Now, there's nobody in school that know that. There's nobody in school that had the compassion to know what goes through me. The school is for me, not no damn teacher. And yet, all that was wiped out. They're going to teach me on the same level that some white boy or girl is being taught on? Because a handful of black folks made it in spite of, not because of, in spite of. But for every black doctor that we made, how many died before they got there? How many got on drugs and, and got them all kinds of crazy stuff before they got there? And so school, to me, was a place that I could be hurt. So watching that clip again, every time I watch it, I feel convicted. It's unbelievable. Uh, Dick Gregory was born in 1932. Uh, the experience that he's talking about happened in 1939. And when I walked into that school with my test and my red pens and my failing grades to those kids uh, who would, over the next few months, suffer with me a drive-by shooting at the school, uh, you know, we were in the heart of the St. Bernard. Uh, for those of you who know about Hurricane Katrina, it was wiped out, uh, but it was a very, uh, very important area to the city. But I walked into that school with my red pens and my papers and what I thought was my best intentions was actually walking into that school and delivering a raw turkey. That's mind boggling, uh, that it took me 20 years, uh, you know, to discover the pain that I caused that young woman and her mother. Uh, but I discovered it in, in what, five minute clip? To me, I think that's the power of the digital archive that wisdom is distilled down to five, three, four, two minute clips. Small amounts of investment have large returns. So large though, uh, that it's completely taken over my thinking about how pedagogy looks and how pedagogy plays out in the classroom. And I do think this clip is largely responsible for me challenging myself and engaging with the digital archive to help create the innovations and pedagogy fellowship 
where professors commit themselves to intently use the digital archive in their classroom. And part of this commitment is born out of one thought. It is if we continue to bring pedagogy, content to these students that is devoid of black experiences such as those that exist in the digital archive, we have continued the raw turkey delivery service. And I know for me, this video helped me retire from that. And I have been very active to also help other people retire and instead to begin to bring students true nourishment. Karen, I think that is probably one of the most important things about this digital archive, that in a time of, you know, we're actually devoid of nourishment just in our social media use and the barrage of, you know, untruths and things that we're sort of, you know, dealing with daily. The archive is the truth. And I think that truth can nourish us. So if I were to sum it up, I would definitely say um, that is probably what is most important about the archive is that it absolutely is good nourishment for our bodies. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, and now I'm inspired to use it in a similar way. Uh, let's bring in Estelle Friedman. Of course, she is a professor at a US, excuse me, a professor in US history at Stanford University. And as well, she is a History Makers 2019 Fellowship Award winner. How are you using this digital archive? Thank you so much. Let me just say it's an honor to be part of this panel. And I'm so grateful for the grant that helped to get this uh, research project going. I'm going to share with you uh, what we're doing with the digital archive. So I am using the History Makers Digital Archive to study the history of sexual violence. I'm doing so um, in a way going back in history in terms of things we talk about a lot today in the Me Too moment. But what do we look at in records of the past to understand the experience of sexual violence, sexual harassment? We sometimes think women didn't talk about these things before our moment. But what kind of sources could historians look at to understand the meaning of harassment and assault in the past? And that's where um, my project, the Oral History Text Analysis Project, is looking at digitized women's oral histories to see what terms were used, which women spoke about this, what types of accounts, and how did that change over time. So our methods are we have collected over 2,700 digitized women's interview transcripts and history makers, which the grant allowed us to bring in, is over a third of our total. I list here some of the other collections that are included. We use the computer to search all kinds of keywords about rape and harassment, abuse, assault, and we found about 330 interviews total with stories and terms about sexual harassment, assault, and responses to it. So that's about 12% of all of the interviews of women who did speak. But let's get to the history makers. So important in our analysis, and I'll give you four reasons. First, just an overview. You saw some of the states of everyone. These are the women's birth states um, in the collection, and you can see how that will compare with all of the women in the collection later. We know that the women in history makers are highly educated. You can see how many have graduate or professional degrees. So we have to be very careful to think about the uh, educational level. But this is the distribution of the age cohorts in the blue bars of the women history makers. And so they really fill in, especially for the late 20th century. You can see how much of our collection uh, for analysis they represent, so very important. Here's the punchline, what we find when we look at the percent of interviews that talked about rape or harassment in any way. If you look at the blue bars, you can see that in the history makers, in those born in the early 20th century, maybe about 15%, those born by after 1940, 20, 25%. Um, on average, about 22% of the history makers women spoke about sexual violence and harassment, exceeding by far the 12% of the whole collection. Now, it may be uh, commonsensical that African-American women in American culture would have more experience of assault and harassment, um, that they're also talking and rem remembering it, excuse me, that they're also remembering it in oral histories is significant. And here's where we have to really read the interviews. And one thing that has come through for me is the way that stories have been passed down over the generations in families 
all the way back to stories from slavery, the Jim Crow era. I found so many of these in History Makers, and I want to play a clip from one of those stories that gives you a feeling for this process of passing down these stories. So let me... Grandmother, her maternal grandmother, was the daughter of the slave owner. And I don't know whether there was ever a marriage to anybody else, but she had a number of children, including my grandmother. Um, and a mother said that she always disliked the fact that she was actually raped and impregnated. And, and so she, she, didn't, um, she didn't want to talk very much about it, but she did tell her children about it in, in her later years. Now, my grandmother told my mother in her later years, and my mother told me in, my, in her later years. It was very interesting how it was passed down. She didn't go into a great deal of detail. Uh, she did have a photograph of this woman, though. I'm going to stop here. There's so much one can tease out of this passing down of the story of assault, but also not the details, and yet letting later generations know what had happened. In the future, we're going to be looking very carefully, comparing African-American women across collections of black women and in other collections, checking educational level and differences and frequencies and type of speech, and refining harassment and rape, and eventually writing up all of these stories. Um, and I look forward to that work. I want to thank History Makers again for collecting these incredible transcripts, making it possible for us to pull them together and do this kind of searching for stories under different kinds of terms. And thank you again. Wow, the work of the History Makers Archive is going to be phenomenal. And it's the only way that these stories get told generation to generation, and they've preserved all of that. Leah, let me welcome you back in, Leah, um, Leah Glenn professor of dance and Africana studies at the College of William and Mary. How are you using this archive in your, in your class? Thank you, Karen, for that welcome. I'm going to go straight to my presentation. At William and Mary, I teach all levels of uh, ballet and modern dance, as well as two history courses, dance history courses history of modern dance and the history of American vernacular dance. Um, the archives are, have been and will be used to supplement existing video viewing and lectures and used as a resource for written assignments. For ballet and modern dance technique classes, the archives have and will, be, will continue to be used as a resource for composition assignments, particularly the ones focusing on dance and social justice. Um, for instance, in my elementary modern one class, one of the assignments that the students have to do towards the end of the semester is create movement phrases inspired by some sort of social justice issue of their choice. And so I encourage them to look at the works of Pearl Primus, um, Donald McHale, and many of the other dance pioneers who have, who have danced. Um, use dance as a means for combating social justice. We also have a course in title performance ensemble that's attached to um, our Orcasis Modern Dance Company. Um, the archives have and will be used as a resource for, for reconstruction of historical dances. Um, for example, Donald McHale's uh, Rainbow Etude, which was inspired by his 1959 work Rainbow Round My Shoulder, was taught to several students um, in performance ensemble. They use the archives as um, a means of, of getting to know Donald McHale's work. Donald McHale, who choreographed uh, the Rainbow Etude, which was inspired by his 1959 work, Rainbow Around My Shoulder. Students learned this etude uh, and used the archives to learn more about his career, particularly during the civil rights movement. In 2016, Cleo Parker Robinson uh, was invited to William and Mary and did a series of workshops and masterclasses. They will be coming back 
in February, um, actually 2021, virtually, to do a similar residency. Um, I will. I plan to have students use the archives to not only study her work, her career, but also that of Catherine Dunham. Cleo Parker Robinson was one is one of the few living dance pioneers who studied directly under Catherine Dunham. Lastly, I've been using the archives for work that I do in my own company, Leah Glenn Dance Theater. One of my most recent works is entitled Nine. It's a tribute to the Little Rock Nine. Nine started out as a solo, a four minute solo inspired by Carlotta Walls Lanier, the youngest of the Little Rock Nine. It premiered in 2017, 2018. After the premiere, I contacted Steve Prince, visual artist, and we collaborated on expanding the piece. The first iteration of the expansion was performed last November. The archives were used as part of the choreographic process in several different ways. When you hear someone's story, it not only informs the narrative of the dance, but also provides um, emotional content. So this piece nine not only tells their story, but also explores or as importantly, explores the emotional terrain that the students experienced, uh, the students, the numbers of the Little Rock Nine experienced during the desegregation in 1957 in Little Rock, Arkansas. The archives are used in a variety of ways um, to enhance the comp dance composition process or the choreographic process. As a choreographer, I use the archives to inform movement choices, to not only tell the narrative, but also to engage the audience in the emotional terrain that the members of the Little Rock Nine experienced. I've asked my dancers to continue to study the archives as we finish building this piece to enhance their performance to get a sense of what, what it was like to be a member of Little Rock Nine and to pioneer in this way. I've also choreographed a piece inspired by a few of Nikki Giovanni's poems. She graciously granted us permission to use three of her poems, Choices, Woman, and a Poem of Friendship. Um, and I use this to create a trio um, entitled Stifled, Sorrowed, and Sustained. My dancers and I use the archives to learn more about her journey as well. And as I mentioned in nine, use of the archives has really informed movement choices and as well as the dancer's performance experience. There's just a, a heightened level of authenticity when you engage in the archives and learn more about the stories of these pioneers. So, I enjoy using the archives. They are they play a vital role in both my teaching and research. That was amazing. Um, thank you, Professor Leah Glenn, also 2019 recipient of the History Makers Fellowship. And I want to ask all of you, um, we're in a pandemic. Education and what it looks like to go to school is completely uh, turned on its head. How can this archive help those who have to homeschool, remote learn, uh, high school teachers, middle school teachers? How, how, how would you suggest? Uh, and I see the heads nodding. So I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Glenn or Professor Glenn. Yes. Uh, I, during the pandemic, I turned my dining room into a dance studio. <laughs> uh, and the archives provide, um, they, they supplement all of my research, they supplement all of my lectures, and just provide a variety of learning, an, another learning tool to, to, for the students to, to grasp the information, to grasp the technique, to understand where the technique's coming from. So that's it's it's been it's been a wonderful wonderful tool, Professor Estelle Friedman. You know, as we are reimagining what education is, and I don't know if it's uh, ever going to go back to normal. 
how how do we how do you see these archives being integrated well i would say that right now when i'm teaching a research seminar where students usually literally go into the archives and put their hands on paper and get to feel things in the library they can't do that now but they can go into history makers uh, because of the work of your archivists there is a whole infrastructure there that they can um, do a whole research paper i've had students you know writing about the civil rights movement they can go in and look at in some of those search tools that you were showing. Thankfully, my library subscribes to the history makers so that my students have access to all of this. So that's terrific. And I think as people learn to use these now in the pandemic, that will continue. I think there should be a period of discovery of many people are going to realize you don't have to get on a plane and go to Chicago to see this. You can do this from your home uh, at any time. D. Mason, 21st century education, the future, you know, uh, flying cars, notwithstanding, we have this, this body of work um, that will be around forever, thanks to the work uh, of the gentlemen, uh, Dan and Mike, uh, and, and Juliana's vision for this. How do you see this reimagining what our education system is going to be? Again, that's this. This is probably the most important question of the moment. Uh, I was recently doing presenting on this archive at a conference around Afrofuturism, and I was sort of imagining this uh, somebody doing some brilliant Facebook-like work, where they actually take all of the interviews, transcripts, body language, sound, voice, all of that stuff, and create an artificial intelligence system that helps us begin to make decisions based on years and years of black experience. And I was sort of talking about how that might actually circumvent a lot of heartache if we could actually leverage what has already happened to begin to make some decisions in the future. And I actually think the more of us who began to actively engage with this digital archive, the closer we get to that sort of community base of knowledge, of learning. And to me, I think that's the big thing. Another quick thing is, you know, this pandemic has been brutal. And I think I was, I was talking about this idea of proximity. And for people of color, proximity is huge. Our learning happens primarily in communities. And that got disrupted by COVID. Uh, for a lot of the students that I'm working with, you know, they found some relief in the archive so that they might be able to establish relationships and learn about people. And through those relationships, learn about themselves which is what I think fundamentally got disrupted during this pandemic. So I think the more of us who use it to have relationships with people, the more of us we start to ward off the anxieties, the depressions, the surprise, and all of those sorts of things. So to me, I think the more, if our education can become more relational, I think we'll discover even more spaces for the archive in our, in our pedagogy. You know, our current uh, racial climate, you know, we're talking about a the viral pandemic, but we also are going through a racial pandemic. And, you know, as I'm listening to these stories and watching uh, the archive, uh, I'm reminded that the problems that we have is because we don't know one another. So I'm just piggybacking on what you were saying, Dean Mason. This archive can be the bridge or the healing balm that we need as Americans to see ourselves through these stories, through these lenses. Um, the archivists that are here, you know, talk a little bit about that. When, when Dean Mason said AI, you know, AI is primarily, is very biased because the people who created the AI usually create things through their, you know, in their own image. They make the AI in their own image. So it, it has blind spots. It doesn't see us, people of color. Talk about how this archive fills in that, that, that gap. That's why I wanted to show as part of the demo, people looking through and finding great stories or, or something that really was meaningful for to, to them. And they were able to then share that with others. So if I'm there, I'm a baseball enthusiast. I find these excellent stories about people that know Satchel Page and played with him. You can capture that, share that out in a text message and share that enthusiasm that in non-COVID times, you might do that in a social gathering now you have to make that social gathering more remotely, but you still have these stories that you can share the fabric of those stories to inspire, to educate, to engage. I really like that verb, engage. And that's what I'm hoping this archive can do, engage people 
in the richness of the stories that are inside the archive. Dan, how do how do we get people to engage? You know, folks who are who who see uh, these stories as oh those the, those stories are for black people. It's not for me. You know, as a person that's been with history makers for more than a decade, why is that important? And and how do we get them to to engage? I think that once people see it, they under they, 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 they you don't have to push them further to actually engage with it. I, I think like as you've seen in the presentations today, it's an enthralling collection of material. It's fascinating once you actually see what's in there. And I think that the the struggle that that I face just day to day as a librarian archivist is helping people discover what's actually in the collections of our archives. And I think that that's a key point. We need to do a better job of connecting with faculty and students to make them aware of this collection because it's all there online for people to use. It's a matter of making them notice it and see it. And, and I think that's, I don't know if I have the answer <laughs> to how do we reach all these undergrads or graduate students or faculty at the universities. But I think that is, once they see it, I think people can kind of, once they, they'll use it. Well, this space is uh, part of the, the solution. And I wanna thank again, uh, Madam Juliana Richardson for the grand vision, uh, because 20 years, 20 years ago, you know, we didn't know about streaming, you know, digitizing as you, as you pointed out, Dan, in your presentation, things were on beta. I remember, you know, the camera crew showing up and, and things, you know, now at the click of a button, we can shrink the world and bring everybody into into the fold. This is powerful. This is amazing. And I want to thank the educators because your your vision for this as well, um, I'm just floored, uh, will we'll make all of this make sense, how you're using this digital archive. Uh, so I want to thank the archivists. I want to thank the educators. And I want to say to everyone watching this right now, find a way to make this an everyday usage because this is too important. Um, it's going to be here forever but it's up to you to make the connection and make the engagement. And now we wanna open the conversation for discussion. And with us today are members of the Higher Education Advisory Committee, Digital Archive Fellows, and Campus Ambassadors for the History Makers, champions who have promoted the archive in hopes of increasing usage across campuses. Let's get a few questions from them. And first, Ian Hartman, Associate Professor of History at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Welcome. Hey, thanks everyone. Uh, I've really appreciated this panel and I wanna thank everyone for sharing your insights and, uh, and just you know, giving me some ideas on a few ways that the archive can be put to such innovative use. It's been, really, uh, it's, it's been a really great panel. And again, I just appreciate hearing all of your voices. Just as a little bit of background on this question, I'm, uh, I'm working with the Anchorage Museum looking for ways to kind of introduce the digital archive into kind of a more what we might call public history setting. And so I've been, uh, you know, following along the, uh, the uses of this archive. And I'm wondering if, if each of you could maybe speak a little bit to how we might bridge the, uh, the gap between kind of the academic setting for the archives, kind of using it in the classroom and maybe incorporating into uh, into public spaces, whether that's going to be in, uh, in in museums or whether that's going to be in historical societies or even schools, K through 12. Um, you know, what what types of uses could we maybe envision for the history makers beyond the uh, the academic classroom? Thank you. I, I'll start with that because I think it's a very interesting question. How do we take these makers that span all different disciplines and tell all these wonderful stories and get people outside the classroom to tap into those stories. And I'll use Denise Graves as an example because she was featured on one of the earlier 20 for 20 days where she's a famous opera singer and she talked about her talent, her voice and the importance of how do you protect your voice, care about your vocal cords. Uh, a musician doesn't play all, all hours of the day yet you're using your voice at all hours of the day. It was a really interesting story. And it was a story that would resonate, not just with people that are professional voice talent, but really anybody that, that talks or sings or laughs. It's like, oh, there's a relationship between all these things. So those sorts of stories, they can tap into those that are studying music, that are on the academic side of things, but it taps into anybody that 
that is just curious about how do you work with voice? How do you work with music? How do you work with laughing? How are these all related? And she tells that in a very interesting story. If we share these stories and make them accessible, that then we open up the fact that Music Maker has all of these interesting possibilities. And I'd like to do that across the different maker categories. The final iteration of Nine will include excerpts from the archives as well during the transitions between each section. So that's one way to introduce the ar archives to the general public during performances. Uh, I also belong to a women's group here in Williamsburg um, that does a, a summer camp for middle school students every year or middle school aged. Um, and I'll be using the archives for our virtual version of that camp as well to teach dance about dance. Um, so those are a couple of ways where I plan to get to, um, I guess, reach the greater community. Um, so it's not just teaching research, I'm, I'm pulling in service as well. That's awesome. Thank you, uh, Leah. And thank you, Ian, for your question. Thank you, Dan, as well. For, uh, excuse me, Mike, for your answer. Uh, let's go to Adrian, Adrian Fletcher, who was an assistant professor and assistant dean of diversity and inclusion at Case Western Reserve University. Welcome. Thank you. And thank you all for, um, I just really appreciate all of the hard work that's gone into, to, into today's presentation. You know, it's been a whole year since we've been with this group and um, this is such important work. So, so, so my question is really not so much about the content um, that history makers provides for our students and for our faculty, but I am curious as to any strategies that you all um, might have to um, really encourage universities to maintain their work and keep history makers available to their students. It's like pushing water uphill. We know the importance. We know how important the content is and how our students can use it. But are there any strategies that you all have used at your universities um, to help keep this resource available? Dean Mason? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I, I think this has gone on maybe two or three years that I've been working with the History Makers Digital Archive. And that question is probably the burning question for every university professor who loves the digital archive. Uh, two strategies that I've used uh, at UVA is uh, to completely uh, challenge this notion that we are invested in uh, creating culturally relevant and culturally sensitive pedagogy. Uh, because if you are truly committed to that, then you must be committed to decentering non people of color narratives in your classrooms. This digital archive is one of the best ways and most accessible ways for us to do that uh, right now, today, like to now. You can begin to use it for that. And I've been able to sort of articulate that all the way across the university from the provost all the way to the you know, chief officer for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and really just talk about how if our university can build an appetite for sitting with black narratives, we can probably build an appetite for doing a whole lot of things. And the cost of the digital archive is actually minimal to the gain that you get if you're able to do that. Uh, the second thing that I've done is, you know, I challenge people to find themselves in the digital archive. And you can do that in any number of ways. But what I challenge people to do, uh, for instance, one of the ways I got hooked with this is John Unsworth sent me a link with the Dillard University search results. And by doing that, he actually made a connection between me and Samuel Cook. That's important because the moment I saw myself and my little HBCU in the digital archive, I could never leave it. And I think if we can strategically help people see themselves in black life, that's when life shifts. That's when things become transformative. I think in this country, we just aren't able to do that. So those are two strategies that I think I've used to great success uh, at the University of Virginia. And I think there's quite an appetite at the moment uh, for trying to tolerate, build, build up an appetite uh, for black narratives. And this is one of the easiest, most accessible ways to do that. Uh, thank you, Dean, uh, Dean Mason. Adrian, uh, Professor Fletcher, uh, I heard from the history makers that Case Western is looking to cancel 
the History Makers Digital Archive. What can we do to change that decision? Well, I really like uh, the strategies that were just proposed. I am a part of, of course, a diversity leadership council. So we do have the ear of our VP for diversity and inclusion. And I really like the notion of examining our commitment, right? No one wants to be accused of not being committed to the black narrative. So examining our commitment and then creating an appetite. And I suppose one of the ways um, that I can think about doing that is to actually do exactly what you all did. Go to the digital archive and, and show our diversity leadership council, this is what is available to you. This is what is available to our students and to the rest of the um, faculty on our campus. So I, I guess I need to lean into that a little bit. And can everyone who's watching this use social media as a pressure point? It's Professor? just start by doing a search of Case Western Reserve University. Start ah. by finding your alum in the digital archive because your university does not want to lose access to that richness. I think that's a great idea, Dean, Fle Dean, Dean Mason. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Professor Fletcher. Let's head over to Gerald Jordan, Associate Professor of Journalism at the University of Arkansas. Welcome. Thank you. And thank you for this program. I, I always appreciate the presentations by the, uh, the folk who have made the History Makers possible. And I want you to know just how much I appreciate the hard work that has gone into this. And lest I sound like an ingrate, I wanna know the, the next step. I've seen um, pieces done on, on digital archives where the person interviewed actually comes back and sits next to the, uh, the person who was asking questions. And it's just amazing. It's just so, so otherworldly. I wonder if, if that is at all in the, the plans for history makers one day down the road. That's part one. Part two of my question is, because I do get my students to dig into history makers for for information, for quotes, as we call them in journalism. Um, I want to know, do the interview subjects have to sign something or uh, do they say, please, no, no follow-ups from this? Because I would like to, uh, to get the kids to be able to follow up with some, uh, some of the history makers who are still with us. Okay. So it's no, quiz bang and follow-up. Dan, Mike? Sure, I can, I can, I can take that, um, and I, I, I'll try to answer them both. Uh, but I think, as I heard both the questions as best I can. So, the original goals of the history makers was to uh, archive five thousand interviews, and as I said earlier, we're we're nearing uh, thirty five hundred. So we still have a lot as far as what's next: doing more interviews and making them more and more accessible, and providing access to more material is always front of mind for me. And and you know, some of the AI ideas and other ways that the, the fellows have explored the archive give us new material as to how to kind of re-explore and reuse the material that's in there already. So I would say, as far as next steps, more material, new ways of getting in and diving into the material for sure. And then as far as, you know, connections with the, um, the people from the archives. I mean, I've had the great pleasure of meeting many of the people that have been interviewed for the History Makers, and it's and it's really that personal touch and seeing them on tape that really makes the collection really, really fascinating. The history makers have done programs in the past called Back to School with the History Makers, where we actually sent people to the, the grammar schools and high schools in their communities, sometimes those places that they went to school to speak to the students in the current time. So we do keep in touch with the interviewees. And if there was a program in mind, the best way would be to reach out to the history makers office and all that and all that information about uh, contacting them is on the, the website, thehistorymakers.org. There's a contact form. And so I would say that would be the, the, the best way to do that. We wouldn't give out anybody's personal information, but we are certainly capable of getting in touch with the people that we've interviewed for the collection. All right, great. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Professor Jordan, for your question. Let's go to uh, Steve Prince, Director of Engagement and Distinguished Artist in Residence at the College of William and Mary. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much for the welcome. It is uh, both a privilege and honor to be able to be a part of this 
um, this event this evening and to be able to ask a question of the distinguished panelists. Um, I, I had the wonderful opportunity of meeting, meeting uh, Julianne Richardson a few years ago at Our Lady of the Lake University and, and down in San Antonio. And, and then over these past few years and in diving into this, um, this program, one of the things that I noted that has been dominant is been, has been the uh, interviews directly with the, the various folks. And I'm wondering, um, have y'all thought of any ideas of ways in which that interaction with, let's say, the artist and musician uh, can go beyond the, the interaction in terms of, um, of the interview format, which is traditional one across from the other and being uh, captured. Um, for example, in the studio or, or, um, or, or directly on stage, or have some of those ideas have been thought of in relationship to um, the History Makers archives? I, th I think it's a, a great question. I know the History Makers has done some of it in the past with their An Evening with series. So for example, you heard about Nikki Giovanni already. Uh, her excellent poetry was read interspersed with interview segments in An Evening with uh, broadcast uh, on public broadcasting channels around the country. So those in the evening with try to mix in some of the performance along with the artist uh, being interviewed. There I'm sure are other creative ways of capturing that interview and maybe capturing some of that performance that the history makers have, has thought about. And Dan, you are closer to the interview process. You maybe have more to say on this. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll add that, you know, occasionally when we've interviewed people who our musicians, they, they'll play a song or sing um, uh, as part of the interview. Um, and that's a really nice touch to a lot of them. We've had people play piano on tape, things like that too. But for the most part, we have done, we have stuck with, you know, the talking head interview type. And we've kind of thought about other things, but haven't really been able to kind of pull it all together on a, a more consistent basis. So like Mike said, we've done public programming where we've had people interviewed on stage with performances. Um, and those are it, those are part of the digital archive too, but nothing that's been like a consistent program, although ideas have been tossed around. For example, we interviewed um, over 200 scientists and we thought, you know, of things like it would be great to have them actually show some of their work as part of the archive too, but it's logistically much harder to pull all of that together on a regular basis. But I think that the community that's here today and the people that are you know, asking the questions to us right now can be a part of that too. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think it has to be a team effort. And if there were ideas that people had out there for performances or for unique ways of showing the content, it should be, a, it would be great to collaborate with them and kind of expand the archive that way. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve, uh, for your question. I just want to jump in during this uh, unique period of time that we're in. Are, are, is it easier to Zoom interview people that you want or, or do you have to physically be there during this time to, to do the archives? Uh, I'll take that one too. So we, the, the quality of video that we're shooting is, is much higher than you could get over a Zoom. And, and that's the part of the purpose of the archive too. So like what you see in the digital archive online is low resolution versions of the actual archival footage that we are uh, uh, taping on a regular basis. So we wouldn't be able to get the quality that would meet the standards of the rest of the collection if we did it all over the internet. And now that might change in the next few years. I'm not sure where the technology of video is going, but as more and more people are forced to do <laughs> video conferencing, I have a feeling that you'll get much higher, higher quality vi video than you previously did. But typically the history makers would travel from town to town and maybe do 10, 12, 14 interviews in one location over the span of a week, and then like, and then get that footage back to Chicago to be archived. Has that been put on hold because of the pandemic? For, yes, and, we have not when, done. When will you resume? I, I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I can answer that question. I don't know if I don't know if I I don't even know when when the world is going to resume exactly. But we've done very few interviews in the year 2020. Um, they, the production pretty much stopped uh, at the end of February. I, I, there might have been a few in March, but we haven't done any interviews since then. And I would say that our crew uh, of videographers and interviewers, Larry Crow, Matthew Hickey, Scott Stearns, Juliana herself, Denise Gines are eager to get back out there and do interviews. Um, so everybody wants to, it's just a matter of doing it safely. I can imagine. 
All right, let's welcome in Roger Carruth, Assistant Professor at Howard University's Kathy Hughes School of Communications. Welcome. Um, and actually, it's, it's great that you introduced me after Professor Meeks, but we actually worked on a project together. Um, she flowed me in on a project that she had with the 1619 project from the New York Times, and uh, it all centered around music and also the, the, uh, the History Makers archives. And um, I came in and um, my portion actually had to deal with music. It was a, it was a broader project, but I used um, uh, Roy Ayers' uh, interview with the History Makers as a part of my remix project. And what I found was that cross collaboration because we are from dis different disciplines. I'm from the School of Communications and uh, she teaches in uh, uh, history. Um, it, it was very beneficial because we were able to use that interdisciplinary approach to kind of feed off each other. And I just want to know if there's a way we can actually um, foster that additional type of, of, of collaborative work um, through through the history makers, particularly ways we can incorporate it into our, 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 our syllabi and our curriculums um, over, over the time that we're, we're teaching. Dean Mason. What is it that prevents you from doing that now? If I heard the question correctly. Right. Um, what is, that is the barrier to having cross collaborative work? I would probably would say, the cons oh, is this for me or just for anybody? Yeah, this is for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wouldn't say it, it prevents it, but I think the, the notion outside of us meeting, you know, outside of the pandemic in February was kind of the impetus for us to be together and actually foster that kind of communication. So maybe a, a more uh, kind of readily um, pushed effort to do that. And, and you're right, we could do it on our own, but it's often out of sight, out of mind. And mm -hmm. because I met Professor Meeks and we sat next to each other um, for the last three years, we were able to talk and just kind of see where where we can actually make some connections and, all, and also Steve as well. Um, so it's not that it, it's lack of happening, but I, I think being able to do it in a very um, uh, deliberate manner is probably more what, I, what I'm trying to say. Mm. And I think to uh, Ms. Hunter's point earlier, I think this might be one of the strengths of social media. So maybe this is one of these moments where we begin to create affinity based groups where we might say, hey, I'm, you know, hashtag collaborate around music, you know, or whatever that would be. You know, I have a very small social media footprint, so I probably sound crazy. But I think that's how that thing works, right? That you can begin to find people who are interested in doing exactly what you said. Uh, I do think it's wonderful to imagine that the history makers can be a conduit for all of the use of the digital archive. I do think we're gonna to have to be a little more aggressive as the consumers of the medium though. Yeah, and I think your your point to the social media, there, there are Facebook groups that you can create that are both private and public. And uh, I would love to see some history maker Facebook groups uh, around this archive that you know branches off into these different areas, uh, these different disciplines. I think it would be powerful and amazing. And you create your own tribe, your own crew. Yeah, and I, I just said if I could just piggyback off of that. You know, we operate in our own silos at times, but being proactive in the social media space and just either putting a hashtag or letting people know what projects you're currently working on in the spaces where people regularly are may be a way to to pull that. Um, that those collaborative efforts in because it's hard to kind of jog your memory and see what other people are doing if they're not necessarily a part of your tribe, so to speak, on a on a continual basis. But you know, we'll, we'll, I'll make some efforts to do a little bit more. Um, that would, I would be greatly appreciate it. I'm sorry. I would love to see this job uh, show up in my hashtag Black Twitter feed. By the way, why yes. is the history makers not in hashtag Black Twitter? I don't know. But that would be a good place to start. Let's get that trending too. All right, let's welcome in Tamiko Meeks, professor of history at Texas Southern University. Welcome. Um, so just going off what Dr. Carruth um, said, we worked together on the 1619 project and just looking for opportunities because we want to um, write about that experience. And so just looking for opportunities to be able to have maybe that work 
um, incorporated into the history makers archive. I don't know, you know, how that works because the assignment that I put together for our cohort was for them to do a mixtape um, using strictly the archives. So just, you know, I don't know if, like I said, that work after it's all been edited, um, if that could be something, if there's like a teaching and learning segment on the history makers um, for that sort of project to be a part of that. So you're asking if the, the work that you do from the history makers archive can be uh, housed on the history makers website. Right. Because I think that that's an excellent opportunity to, you know, again, showcase the archives, but also for any instructors that are professors that are looking for ways in which to incorporate that into your into the classroom, having examples of that, I think is um, excellent. Thank you for that, that question. So we are almost wrapped up with our first round of innovations and in pedagogy fellowships uh, that were jointly hosted by the History Makers and the Andrew Mellon Foundation. And we had uh, 11 fellows uh, who were doing exactly what you're saying, who committed themselves to using the digital archive to enrich their courses uh, by using mixtapes, by using playlists, by having people supplement readings with the, the, the oral history material. All of that has been done for a semester and each one of the fellows agreed to submit evidence of the teaching uh, so that we might begin to inform other people's pedagogy. So I do think we are working through the, the, uh, the, the platform for other professors to begin to either participate as fellows in the future or submit work that might begin to influence pedagogy across the country. So just stay tuned uh, because we are absolutely committed to that and are finishing up our first round of collection of you know, assignments, syllabi, you know, uh, teaching statements. All of those things have been collected all semester uh, from 11 faculty right now who are doing exactly what you said. And you are right on point that I think, uh, you know, the first stage of this, if I had to just sort of go back to one of the earlier questions, the first phase of this oral history work through the history makers is to archive the stories themselves. To me, the second is to figure out how to actually use them. And I think one of the primary uses is going to be coming through education. I think that's where we're going to be. Uh, so you are right on point, I think, to be asking that question about how do you contribute uh, and how does the work that you do become a part of the Black archive itself, the history making archive too. Uh, stay tuned, because I think that's on the way. Yes, thank you, Dean Mason, for that response. And thank you, uh, Professor Meeks for for the question and what a great discussion it's been interesting to see how the archive is being used I know we all look forward to discovering new ways to use this collection and I hope this conversation has inspired you to explore a bit deeper and think a bit more creatively I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight I'm your host Karen Hunter and get to work using this history makers digital archive